But anyway, anyway, so we're going to talk about the seals, uh, the fifth and sixth seals. Now, uh, next week, we're going to talk about the Jewish evangelist, yeah. Jewish evangelist and the seventh seal. But for this week, we're going to talk about the fifth seal. Now, when he opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of who had been, those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne, they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And they were each given a white robe. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. The white robe? Does that sound like a promise you read back in Revelation 3? Mm -hmm. We'll look at that. They were given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. That means it's not over, right? There's more coming. Who were to be killed as they themselves have been. So... First thing I want to look at is I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. Now, this leads me to believe that it's tribulation saints, not the souls of all the martyrs. If you look in some of your commentaries, you'll see that some people believe it's basically from Stephen on. I don't think so. And the reason why is because we have souls here. If we believe in the rapture of when it is, then all of those souls already have glorified bodies. Okay? These are disembodied souls. Now, it could be a lot of times in the New Testament the word soul. Uh, what did the Titanic headline say? How many? What, it said 1,500 what lost? Souls lost. Souls lost. Okay? So it, that is an ancient. You know, that's, that's how they used to talk about people. So it could be that this is not actual the soul. It's actual souls, meaning in the scripture it says, save the soul from hell. It, it, in James 5, it says, if, you know, if you pray for the sick, et cetera, et cetera, save the soul from hell. It could be that that soul there is the same, it's like a, a euphemism for a person's life. So, but it's interesting that they're, the position of these martyrs is under the altar. Now, you've all got your notes there, so I'm, I'm able to go a little bit faster. Uh, at the temple in Jerusalem, now, when was this written? When is John writing this? What year, roughly? 95, 90 to 95 A.D. Okay, what happened 20 years before? 20 years. What happened about 25 years before that? Go ahead. The sacking of Jerusalem and the fall of the temple. So, this is looking past, but we, we can have to go back into Deuteronomy and to see how the temple is laid out. Okay, And we, we have two altars in the temple. So in the temple, in Solomon's temple and Herod's temple, there were two altars, and even in the tabernacle. Uh, one was the altar of burnt sacrifices, and the other is an altar of incense. Who was ministering incense when they were told that their child was about to be, or when their wife was with child? Anybody remember? It was, it was their job that one day in their whole life. <laughs> Starts with a Z. Yes. He, he was uh, the course of Abijah, and he was, that's what he was doing. When he was in there, uh, when the angel visited him and said, your wife's going to have a son, his name's going to be John the Baptist, basically we know he's John the Baptist. He was at the altar of incense, burning incense. The altar of the burnt sacrifices was different. So uh, the altar of burnt sacrifices stood in front of the temple, and that was where the daily sacrifices were made. And so the idea is that they're probably under that altar. Remember, everything we saw on earth is, is a model of what's in heaven and what will be again in the future temple. We see that in Ezekiel 40 to 48. If you really want to know what the millennial kingdom looks like, it probably looks nothing like you think until you read Ezekiel 40 through 48. Okay? So the idea is this, that they were suffering persecution. They would naturally seek refuge in a place where expiation had been made for sin. Uh, and that would have been the altar of sacrifice. So, looking again 
it says, They cried, O oh Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? If you read it just for what it is, it almost sounds like they're doubting God. If you read that just point blank, it says, How long, Lord? What are you doing? It kind of sounds like a doubt. I don't think so. I think it's probably more of a question. They're just asking the question, you know, hey, when, when are we wrapping this up? Okay, I don't think they're doubting God. Um, they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer. Say, hey guys, it's almost over, but you're going to have some friends come and they're going to come join you. Um, and that harkens back to Revelation 3, 4. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they're worthy. There's the promise. All right? They were given each a white robe. Notice, they didn't have it at first. They're given the white robe at this point in time in Revelation 6, which is a fulfillment of those in Sardis. Okay? So this is part of the um, the rewards in heaven. And we also see this in Revelation 7, 9, looking a little bit forward. I saw and looked, and behold, a great multitude that no man could number, from every nation, from all tribes, peoples, and languages. See, this lends credence to the fact that the tribulation period is not just for the Jews being saved. There are, if you look at some of your commentaries, that's what some people think, that it's just Jews. Well, that says, right, that says, no, every nation, all tribes, peoples, and languages. So, he could have just kept a great multitude no one can number from everywhere, but I think, you know, John is wanting to be extremely specific that this is a, a potpourri of people. This is, he is, right here in this verse, he is putting to rest the idea that it's just for Jews. And you've got to remember, Revelation 7 is what we're going to look at next week. That deals with the 144,000. So the reason why he talks about this in that same chapter, so to speak, is because you could easily get confused that there's going to be 144,000 and they're going to be all Jews, and that's it. No. They were standing before the Lamb, and there it is again. They're clothed in white robes, and they have palm branches in their hand. So, uh, I said to him, Sir, you know, because he asked, he asked, who are these people? In Revelation 7, 14, he said, These are the ones coming out of, great, out of the great tribulation. This is not great tribulation. Remember, in the Greek, we have this thing called the definite article. When that little definite article is there, it means something specific. If the definite article had been left off, it would have said they're coming out of great tribulation, and then we might have could have opened it up through all the course of church history and all the martyrs going back from Stephen on to the present day and then in the future. But it says the great tribulation. There's the specific time. What's another word for the great tribulation? Let's, let's get Hebrew on us for a second. Anybody, what, what do we call that? The time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We need to remember that nothing makes you white but blood. If you really think about it, it's a gory religion. But why, why blood? Why, 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 do we, why did God choose blood for salvation? Exactly. God wants you to know exactly how serious sin is. It's a life and death matter. That's the reason why Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. It was probably just good. I mean, just as, as good. I mean, I'm sure he didn't throw a bunch of rotten pumpernickels, um, pumpkins up there, right? But it wasn't life. Anybody can grow a vegetable. All right. Taking a okay. A little bit of training, you too can grow a vegetable. But taking a life is is something to be taken seriously. Or it should be. Yes, sir. And exactly right, Brother Herman. 
Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And the reason why it costs the shedding of blood is because sin is a life and death matter. And unless you are looking at it from that perspective, you won't ever get it. And Jesus became our sacrifice. That's right. Instead of bulls and goats and all that stuff. That's right. Bulls and goats and lambs and everything and little damsy dodgies and all that. That was the that was the payment of the interest. Whenever you got a house note or a car note, you know that you you know you got a portion of it that goes to pay interest. Well, all that did for all those years was pay the interest penalty. And then Jesus paid the principal on the cross. But they shoved, I saw a woman drunk with the, uh, this is in Revelation 17, and we also have in Revelation 16. They've shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, so we have martyrs. This is what we're talking about in the fifth seal, is martyrdom. Um, and then we look at Daniel 7, going back. This horn, this is the Antichrist. He made war with the saints. Now this is something, and prevailed over them. Isn't there a scripture that says that, that Satan can't prevail? Yes, there is. Matthew 16, 18. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is another allusion to what I think is allusion, that we are not talking about the church. Because if it was truly the church, then he would not be able to prevail over them. It's one thing to make war with them. It's one thing to make war with us as Christians, but you're not going to prevail over us because we have the promise of Christ. Right. However, the church age ends at the rapture of the church. It's done. Now you've got 144,000 crazed Jews evangelists, Jewish evangelists going around. You know, Gentiles, we had our chance. Now we're on that wagon again because 70... Weeks are determined for the people of Daniel, the Jew, and we got one week left. So this leads me to believe that the only reason why they prevail is because the church is not there. So, uh, anybody do any of the homework that I asked? I sent it out via email. I said I wanted. To, I, I was asking for some verses which promise us persecution. So, John sixteen thirty three. Speak it. Can I read it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have said these things to you that in you you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I will overcome the world. Excellent. That's that's perfect. What else? Is there any more? Okay, what does it say? Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Is it that one? Mm -hmm. and I think Bob, is that one yours too? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Um, we're going to have persecution if we're doing it right. You're not being persecuted. Probably not doing something right. All right, um, you're either huddled in your in your cave, not having any interaction with anybody <laughs> except for you and your church family, or you're not behaving right out there. Okay, both of two of which are problems. If you're not interacting with people, in order to get that evil eye look like you crazy fool. <laughs> Or if you're not out there preaching on Facebook, you have no idea how many posts I have to delete. <laughs> As I've always said, my Facebook wall is a benevolent dictatorship. You exist at my will and pleasure. If you, if you come and pee on my wall, I'm going to remove you from the, from the premises. Okay? My Facebook page is a benevolent dictatorship. All right? You look at us and us and compare to the rest of the world. That's really exactly right. It is a reality of persecution. Uh, so there are the verses. Uh, here are some verses which promise this persecution. Strengthening the souls of the, of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. 
So, now this is a toughie for us as Americans. When facing persecution, what is our proper attitude? Gratitude. Thankfulness. Thankfulness. I'm glad you said that. They left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They had been beaten, spit on, called all sorts of names, made all sorts of false accusations. Now, this is the proper way. Would somebody dare guess the American way? <laughs> what's, our, what's our American way of, of enduring persecution? Pass them out and move on. That, unfortunately, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's true. Uh, What's the other American way? Run and hide. Run and hide. Okay. Silent. Silent. All right. Uh, how about getting, <coughs> we get indignant? Bless you. Don't we sometimes get indignant? Well, I'm an, I have rights. I have a First Amendment right. I'm gonna get my pound for Uh huh. Exactly. And, and you know that's a that is a product of being an American. I'm, I'm red, white, and blue to the core. All right, and that's part of the issues that I struggle with is, you know, yeah. it's one thing to stand up and defend. Um, remember, meekness is strength under control. You know, you know what the perfect illustration of, of meekness is? A racehorse. Does the will of the rider. Yeah. Yeah, that racehorse does the will of the rider. He, he just goes where the rider tells him, but if he wanted to, or if that mayor wanted to, you, yeah. Anybody's ever had a horse, you know that if that horse, if you don't, if that horse don't want to do something, you ain't got enough physical strength yeah. to make them do it. Why All right. advantage of you like that? Exactly. And they will, they will, as a matter of fact, those of you who have who've ridden, you know, you know that a horse, if they know you're a novice, They'll take advantage of you. Or a child, a lot of times. Or a child, yeah. Noah, our horse, was real good about that. She, she know, like, you don't know what you're doing, so guess what, buddy? <laughs> you know? So, Philippians 129, for it has been granted to you. I, I really like this verse. It's been granted to you. That for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer his sake. There's two things here given to you as a gift. One is your beliefs. The, you know, because John 6 44 says what? Come on. John 6 44. No man can, can come to the Father unless he draws, him he draws him. That's God granting you for the sake of Christ. But he's also granted us persecution. Now that doesn't sound like a gift a lot of us will want. You know, you get that as the white elephant gift at the Christmas party, you're probably going to want to pass it on and pick another one. But that's a gift from God. Yes, sir. From experience, first, when you're so-called persecuted or whatever, for spreading the gospel or whatever, it seems so terrible. But afterwards, when you Matured, you look at it and you can actually smile and mm -hmm. say, you know, that was from the Lord. And it I, is. I'm thankful. It is. It, it's I, something to be thankful for. I it. And that is a sign of Christian Christian maturity, Herman, because mm -hmm. to be thankful for something that you your your flesh says you don't want. Right. It's kind of like it don't seem good. it's kind of like fasting. Later, yeah. You know, it's kind of like fasting. Fasting is not supposed to be a comfortable act. That's, you know, um, it's supposed to bring discomfort. And it's very important. I used to whine and cry like a big baby. Now the truth's coming out. Kerry says he threw a fifth. He didn't whine and cry. Well, oh, let me go back. 1 Peter 4.13, But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. So they rejoiced at the gift they had been given. And you rejoice again. I mean, you, you, we rejoice. You know the Apostle Paul says, Be absent from the body of the present with the Lord. 
Right. Oh. But that means uh, you're going somewhere. Yeah. You're saying, you're right. Uh, yeah, you know. You're a super well, you know, Jesus said, you know, don't fear the one who can destroy the body. Fear the one who can destroy the body and send both body and hell. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's sold in hell, but right. They receive the glorified body during the rapture. Right. Come down back into that body and raise it up. You know, I think I would. I, I don't know about you guys, and I'm sure I'm sure most of us are the same. I can handle persecution myself. I don't think I'd have a problem with it, but it would be one of those things that some of the Christians are facing in the Middle East today when they got my daughter up there. They, I, I think I can handle persecu- physical persecution, torture for the name of Christ myself, but watching my child go through it, now, that takes a special kind of faith. Uh, especially when they're looking at you like, Daddy, can't you stop this? Because, I, I mean, I, nobody likes to see their child hurt. If you're, you know, just tears me up inside. Um, so, over there, they murder their kids in front of them. They murder their kids in front of them. So, you know, and that's, you know, really, that's nothing new. People have been murdering kids in front of they're, you know, and, and poking their eyes and basically blinding them, so that's the last thing they saw. They've been doing that for thousands of years. They defile the water, mm-hmm. they kill the children, they beat them with a rod, so they break every bone in their body, and then they kill the wife, and you have to see all that when they dispatch you. Well, as long as they would dispatch me, I'd be okay. Well, couldn't live with that. Please. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Six seal. The stars of the sky fell to earth as the and I'm, I'm just I skipped the reading of it and this is the, we're down into the parts of it they fell to earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale the sky vanished like a scroll being rolled up now this is very interesting uh, this the part here where it says the stars fell to earth there are some conventional and unconventional interpretations on this and I'm going to give you the unconventional one because the conventional one is that it's like a meteor shower. It's just like asteroids or you know meteorites or big rocks falling from heaven, and and it could be. Uh, I don't think so, because uh, I think it's spiritual. And I, I take that from a from a bunch of different scriptures. But Revelation twelve four says his tail. This is remember Revelation twelve is is. Uh, when we get past about Revelation 9, we got a whole period of about eight chapters there that's kind of, it's not in chronological order. It's kind of, you know, it could be happening here and there. Uh, I believe that this part in Revelation 12 that we'll talk about in a few weeks is where Satan basically is finally kicked out of heaven. Remember, Satan still has access to the throne. Okay? We see that in Job. Uh, if you really want an interesting view of it, look at 1 Kings 22, where uh, God is is wanting to punish uh, a king, and 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 he doesn't, you know, the king doesn't want to hear from the prophet, and the prophet says, "Hey, this is what I saw." God, you know, there's these, the sons of God basically before the throne room, and one of the demons is there going, "I got an idea to punish this guy. I'm going to go lie to him. I'm going to make his prophets lie to him and say he's going to be okay to go up in a battle." First Kings 22, really interesting exchange there. But at this point, Satan is thrown out of heaven, and he takes a third of the stars of heaven and casts them to the earth. I think that this is the sixth seal. I think the stars here are, as as we see uh, throughout Scripture, stars are heavenly bodies, right? Uh, and I believe here is is the linkage that this analogy of the stars is actually demons. Uh, Revelation 9.1 said, A fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven, a single star, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He is, this is an entity. I don't believe, uh, you know, Beta Centauri is going to fall literally, you know, a star. First of all, it couldn't fall from the heaven and it'd burn us up. So, 
here is a, a classic example where a star is used, and it's definitely not a star. Right. It's a demon, a, a demon, a demonic being. Uh, he was given a key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. So I think that is what's happening here. And i got to really move here. The sky is rolled up like a scroll. Again, this could be literal, but it also could be spiritual. And I wanted to read some verses here, and this is why I'm glad Kathy printed this out. Psalm 104, verse 2, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. Uh, Isaiah 40, verse 22, as he sets above the circle of the earth, inspiration of the Bible verse, by the way, Isaiah 40, 22, because how did Isaiah know that it was a circle? But here it is, right, plain as day. It's a circle. The Bible calls it a circle. <laughs> He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. It could be a com combination, but I think what's happening here, in order for these demons to be cast down like they are, I think there's a tearing probably of the fabric of space-time. I know that's very sci-fi, scientific. Something I think is going on other than the sky being rolled up like a scroll because I'm a meteorologist and I can tell you that just doesn't make any sense to me as a scientist. So it has to be something. Could be one dimension to the other. Yeah, it could. Yeah, that and that could be what it is. Uh, just the sky being rolled up cre would create a vacuum, and it just it doesn't make any sense. Plus, plus the fact that it describes people as still being on Earth and going into caves. I mean, they're, right. They're, yeah, and that's to be able to survive. matter of fact. Good lead in, Mark. Kings of the Earth, they hid themselves in the caves. <laughs> Among the rocks. I love this class. <laughs> Calling to the mountains and the rocks, follow us and hide us from the face of the one that's sitting on the throne. Those who are dwelling on the earth are aware of the origin of the judgment. That's what I find interesting about this. There's not a bunch of ignorance going on. They know right. who's doing this to them. And they don't repent. They don't. they don't repent. This is the beginning of the great tribulation. It says, for the day of their wrath has come. The day of whose wrath? The Lamb and the Father. Their wrath, their day of wrath has come. Now, this is important. Yeah. Well, it's important because in 1 Thessalonians 5 9, it says, For God has not destined us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, the bottom line here is that the, at this point, the rapture had to have happened. Because this is when wrath comes on the earth. Unless God is going to supernaturally protect people through the tribulation, that if he somehow, if it's post-trib, if it's a post-trib rapture, somehow God has to supernaturally protect the church through this day of wrath. Because they're not appointed to wrath. That's right. Okay? And in the context, this is not talking about the wrath of God on sin. Which is where some people get off into the weeds. If you look at the, the whole passage there from 1 Thessalonians 4, the latter part of 1 Thessalonians 4 into, into chapter 5, you see that the context is the day of the Lord. So there's something else. This is not just wrath on sin. So this leads me to... i got just enough time. Okay. If those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. This is Matthew 24, verse 22. Now, why am I saying this in the context of a great earthquake? There's a real, re there's a real good reason, believe it or not. Uh, there's possibilities that the actual number of days are cut short. In other words, God says, you know what? They've had enough. I'm going to shorten this judgment. That ain't what it is. And I'm, There's a reason for that, that that's not what it is. And it's real easy to see that unless you really think about it. Because if that's what it is, then God didn't know what he was talking about in Daniel. Because God said there was 1,260 days. And he also gave another period of time. There's 1,290 days. There's 1,335 days. He gave these periods of time. And if God cuts the day short, then he was wrong back there. And he didn't know what he was going to do. Which means he ain't God. So we know that can't be because we know God knows everything, right? So... I came up with an interesting theory a few, well, it was about 10 years ago. Ah, no. Nope. December 26th, it will be 11 years. Uh, that the number of days stay the same, but the length is shortened by the earthquake. 
And I'm going to show you some scientific evidence of that happening. Uh, for example, a, I'm just using this example when I say this is what happened. A 24-hour day now becomes a 16-hour day because the Earth's rotation has sped up. And what that would do is that you would still leave your 1,260 days as promised by the Scripture. But instead of that being 30,240 hours long, that would be only 20,000. So actually the days have been cut short. Literally, if you look at it, those days are cut short. So instead of 24 hours, they're 20 hours, or 21 hours, or 16. And what that means is the overall length of time is shortened, even though the number of days is not. Is everybody tracking? Uh, so basically, if it was cut by a third, that would be equal to 420 days being cut off the period of judgment, even though there's still 1,260 rotations of the earth. Now, shortened days. This is an interesting article. Massive earthquake that stuck, remember the, the Japanese earthquake back in 2011? It actually shortened the length of the 24-hour day by 1.8 microseconds because it spun the earth faster. The, the earthquake was so powerful, it spun the earth. Well, it's not the only time that it, that happened. Uh, the Chilean earthquake altered the earth axis. It shortened the day because it sped up the earth's rotation when an 8.8 .8 magnitude happened. But when I, the Sumatran earthquake is when I kind of started putting these together. When I read an article that the earthquake was so powerful, and this is actually from a CNN article from back then. I was able to pull it up back in 2004. was so powerful, it accelerated the Earth's rotation, geophysicists have declared, they estimate the shock wave shortened the period of our planet's rotation by three microseconds. So, what that means is, this earthquake that's going to happen is like unlike anything else. And it could be so powerful that it literally speeds the Earth's rotation up. If these smaller earthquakes, relatively speaking, can speed the Earth's rotation up, then I, something that's never happened since the history of man, it moves the mountains, the moves the mountains and the islands out of place, that is yeah. going to speed the Earth's rotation up. Yeah. So those people there are not going to have a 24-hour day. They're going to have a 12-hour day. Or whatever it is. But guess what? Somehow, see this is another instance where you can trust the Word of God. Because somehow a day gets shortened. Now prior to this generation, nobody knew that that was even possible. I mean, you look at the words of Christ and you go, wow, how is that? that? That can't happen. Shortening the day. That's just stupid. Imagine how many skeptics have looked at that and go, that's just stupid. That can't happen. They're going to shorten the day. So, but... We now know it can happen. And there's a time coming in the future that's going to be noticeable. And on a side note, real quick, I read an interesting article, uh, and I think I even posted it on my Facebook page, maybe not, I don't know, um, that they were talking about the days being longer because of climate change. That over the next, and it was this, it was this uh, UK article uh, from a, a paper book, because of global warming, we're going to have longer days. And I'm like, yeah, but we just had three earthquakes in the last 10 years that sped the period of time up. Because they were talking about it being longer by like one millisecond. Well, I'm like, well, we just had an earthquake that sped it up by three. So overall, we're still a plus two, right? <laughs> so, uh, and that was over the next hundred years, by the way, that climate change, because the oceans were going to get bigger and it was going to be more uh, crazy talk. <laughs> If you're, if you're smart enough to be able to tell the difference between a microsecond and a millisecond and, and you exist in that kind of domain, then... But anyway, that's, that's my theory on that earthquake. That it's going to be so great that it's going to speed up the rotation of the earth. Now, imagine the devastation that that would have. When your earth, when, you, when your whole cycle is is used to a certain amount of daylight per day and a certain amount of light night during your growing season. Um, and there's some other things that are meteorologically coming up that I really can't wait to talk about. One of them is the, the idea that there's no wind blowing on the earth. And as a meteorologist, I can tell you, when I finally put two and two together on that one, when I said there's no wind blowing on the earth, that's crazy. Because as a meteorologist, and I'm going to speak as a meteorologist that day and explain just exactly how bad that would be. A lot of people would think, well, it's kind of like walking out in the morning when the wind. No, 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 no. It's no wind on the earth for, I think it's five months. It's absolutely devastating. 
to the planet. No ocean currents. No ocean currents, no thunderstorms, no rain. So, I mean, so, I guess we need to get going. So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I say this every week, Lord, but we are increasingly aware of how wonderful your word is that you, you knew that there was an, a round earth before anyone else, Father. And I, and I often wonder if Isaiah even wondered what he was writing. Why did he say a circle? It doesn't make sense to that man. Father, and I wonder about the psalmist who talks about caverns in the sea and, and things that they know not of. And Father, it's just amazing to me that all throughout your word you can see that you have declared your majesty, that you're sovereign. And Father, we see it even today. Lord, when we, we speak about how certain things can happen and, and we just had no clue. But science always confirms your word, Father. And we're thankful for that. Lord, as we go, I pray uh, this week that we would be ambassadors for you. Help us to not forget that we are your servants. And we're here to rejoice in you, Father, and we are to give thanks, not only for our salvation, but for the persecution that comes. And Father, we do once again pray for those brothers and sisters overseas, Lord, and, and all throughout this world, Father, that are facing persecution today, who some of which are drawing their last breath as we speak. Father, if it ever comes to that here, Lord, I pray you would give us the faith and the strength to stand firm on our beliefs. And we give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.